Hey there and welcome back to Mr. Vyshinsky's video tutorials. In this episode we're going to look at advanced dihybrid hybrid crosses. We're going to be pushing dihybrids hybrids to the limit. We're looking at epistatic interaction, multiple alleles, codominance, even some sex link. Basically these are the going to be the hardest dihybrid hybrid questions that you're going to be facing and we're going to just take a look at a few examples here today. If you haven't already looked at the basic dihybrid hybrid crosses video, I would suggest going to do that as a lot of these problems will be building off of the skills that we're developing in a more basic die hybrid situation. With this, we're still going to be doing the five-step success method, going through the five steps. As you can see here, again, legend is going to start off first, never changes. If you, with your legend, you can get your genotypes and you can even look back to make sure you've answered the question correctly. Obviously, your parent genotypes will be important and this in dihybrids, hybrids and in particular these advanced dihybrid hybrid problems the gamete step is so so crucial because it can actually end up saving you time and make it prevent you from rewriting the entire half of the Punnett square twice when you don't actually need to once we have our gametes done we can go ahead and do our Punnett squares and from there we can obviously get our genotypic and phenotypic ratios. This is nothing different, this is not new. You should have been practicing this from monohybrids into basic dihybrids and now into advanced dihybrid problems. So in the first example we can see that coat color in mice is controlled by the interaction of two genes on separate chromosomes. We can see that black is dominant to brown and pigment is dominant to the lack of pigment. What we'll do there is we're just going to write our legend right out. So we have big B is equal to black, little b is equal to brown, C is equal to pigment, and little c is equal to a lack of pigment. If we continue reading, we can see that when a mouse is homozygous for lack of pigment, it is epistatic to big B or little b, masking the gene and creating albino mice. To me, that's really important. We should be writing that in our legend. So what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to write blank, blank, little c, little c, and we know that this is going to be an albino phenotype. And then if we finish reading, we can see that the question is asking for the phenotypic ratio of the offspring of two black mice that are heterozygous for each gene. Immediately that's telling me the parent genotypes. We're still trying to follow our five steps for success. So let's write in the parent phenotypes here. We have big B, little b, big C, little c, crossed with a, another dihybrid heterozygote. And those are our two parent genotypes, step two in our five steps for success. If we do FOIL, we can see that we can get four different gametes out of this parent. So we have big B, big C, big B, little c, little b, big c, and little b, little c. And it's exactly the same because the other one is also a dihybrid heterozygote. So we can write these same gametes on the other side under the other parent. When we look at this, we can see that there's four different gametes for each parent. And that information is relevant because now we know that we're going to make a 4 by 4 Punnett square. Now we've figured out how big our Punnett square needs to be, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to draw a 4 by 4 Punnett square. Alright, here's our 4 by 4 Punnett square. And what we're going to do, we're just going to fill in the genotypes very qu quickly on the sides and on the top. After that, I'm going to throw the gametes into each slot and down the side as well now all we need to do is fill in the Punnett square and that's what I'm going to do very quickly here this is the long notation the other way to do it you need to make sure you're thinking and make sure you don't misunderstand anything but it can also help you speed things up more on like a multiple choice question that's where they become very useful 
And now that our Punnett square is complete, we can start to analyze it and see if we can figure out the genotypic and phenotypic ratios. So initially what I can see is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 black mice. I can also see 1, 2, 3 brown mice. And the other 4 that I'm going to leave white there, I can see 4 albino mice. I know those mice will be albino because if we look back to our legend, we can see right here that anytime we have little c, little c, it's going to be albino. So I see one, two, three, four albino mice. And what that's going to do, we can write a genotypic and phenotypic ratio. So let's write a genotypic ratio first. It's a typical dihybrid heterozygote cross. So we're going to get that nine to three to three to one ratio where the nine are going to be dominant for both genes. This first three will be dominant for the B gene and recessive for the C gene, while the second three is going to be recessive for the B gene and dominant for the C gene. Finally, the last one there is going to be recessive for both genes, and that's our genotypic ratio. Usually I like to put the genotypic ratio first because now we can just write the phenotypic ratio right beside it. We know that these nine they have color and they have a dominant allele so we do know that there's going to be nine black. Going down to the next level we can see that we have two little c's so that means there's going to be a lack of pigment so these three mice are actually going to be albino. Going down to the next row we can see that pigment is present and in this case it's little b little b so we know that these three mice will be brown. And lastly, we look at the genotypes of that lone one left. We can also see that it has the little c, little c, so there's no pigment for this brown to be activated, so this last one will be albino. As you can see, our phenotypic ratio isn't in lowest terms because we have three albino right here, and we have one right here. So that actually means that we have four albino. So if I scroll all the way to the top again, we're going to look in the green. It's asking for what is the phenotypic ratio for these mice. So what we're actually going to do as our final answer, we're going to say that it is 9 black to 3 brown to 4 albino. And put a box around it because that's our final answer. Now just as a little shortcut, you know that this is always going to be that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. You don't actually have to do your Punnett square, although if you feel more comfortable, that's absolutely fine, but it may be on a multiple choice question. You can actually just take a look. We know that in any dihybrid heterozygote cross, we're going to have 9 that are dominant. Dominant? We'll have 3 that are dominant for the first gene and recessive for the next gene. The third one here will be recessive for the first gene and dominant for the last gene. And finally, the last one will be recessive for both genes. If you are able to go and start from this dominant-dominant thing and turn it into a genotype, and then finally a phenotype, that is a good way to take kind of a shortcut because these problems can be very time-consuming in a multiple-choice question. This is usually a good idea. But in the end, and you'll still get the same answer. So why don't we move on to our next example. So the first sentence here says that hemophilia is an X-linked recessive condition. We know right off the bat that we're dealing with some sex-linked inheritance. So let's just keep that in mind. And let's write that in our legend. So we know that it's, since it's recessive, we know X to the big H is a normal phenotype. And we know x to the little h is a hemophilia phenotype. If we keep reading, we can see that our next sentence will give us 
part of our legend and part of our appearance. So we can see that a normal man who is homozygous for blood type B is one of the parents. We also know now that it is a blood type allele, which in itself is codominant and even multiple alleles. We have IA, IB, and which are both codominant to each other. And both of those are actually dominant to little i. So let's write that in our legend as well. We know that IA, the blank, is going to be blood type A. Also, IB with a blank could be blood type B. IA, IB is equal to blood type AB. And finally, our little i's recessive to both IA and IB give an O phenotype. So let's write in the normal man's genotype. We know that he is homozygous for IB. And he's also a man, making him XY. And he was normal for the condition, so he has a capital H on there. If we continue reading the question, it says he marries a normal woman who has a hemophiliac father and is heterozygous for type A. That sounds like a mouthful, but what we know is she's heterozygous for type A, so she must be IA, little i, for her blood type. And since she's a woman, we know that she's XX. She is normal, but she had a hemophiliac dad. Since her dad can only give her one X chromosome, and if he did have the condition, we know that she will have the little h on her second X chromosome. From here, we're going to foil the gametes, and we're going to see that it's IB, XH, IB, Y, IB again, with another XH, and I, B, Y again. Each cell will always create four gametes. I've written all four out. Some of you may see that there's two doubles, and I'm going to take care of that in a second and show you how to cut down your Punnett square and save some work. If we continue and do the woman's gametes, we'll see that she's I, A, X, big H, I, A, X, little h, little i, X, H, and little i, X, little h. Now that we have our gametes set up and ready to go, before we do our Punnett square, we should actually just take a look and see what the question is asking for. We can see that it's asking for the probability of them having a child with AB blood and hemophilia together. So that's what we're going to look for. I'm going to leave that highlighted in green. So just looking at the gametes, this is the most crucial step in these advanced dihybrid hybrid problems because writing all these alleles with X-linked and multiple alleles, it can be very confusing and doing a 4x4 four four Punnett square is usually extra work and it's very time consuming in particular if this was a multiple choice question. So what we want to do is we want to save time anywhere we can. You'll see that the male only has two different gametes, this one here and this one here are actually just duplicates of the first two. And the woman's gametes, we have one, two, three, four different ones. So now what we can conclude is we can do a two by four Punnett square and save ourselves some work. So let's do that. Let's do our two by four Punnett square. I'm just going to draw one here with the magic of a smart board. All right, so here's our two by four Punnett square. And what we're going to always do, just like normal, is we're going to put our genotypes on each side. So we know that this was IB, IB, X, big H, Y. And the female was IA, little i, X, big H, with an X and a little h. Now that we have the genotypes on each side, I'm going to fill in the gametes into the Punnett square so we can solve the problem. And the female's gametes are complete. Now I'm going to look at the male. He can only make two different gametes, one of which is this one here, and the other one is this one here. So now all that's required is to fill in the Punnett square. We can see that our genotypes are all very different. An easy way to do a phenotypic ratio is just to use another Punnett square itself. And we can just fill in the Punnett square in the 
respective locations for the phenotype. So we know that all the females are on the top row. So going all the way back to the top, we look in the green, see what we're looking for. So we're looking for the probability of them having a child with AB blood and hemophilia together. So we can look at our phenotypic ratio here. We can see that four of them are AB and only one of which is hemophiliac. Now that we've used our Punnett square, we can just write down the answer. We can see that it's a one out of eight chance. If we were to convert that to a decimal, it would be 0.125 or even if you were to convert it to a percent, that's also okay if it's not specified for a 12.5%. And this is our answer, so we'll box it. So hopefully this episode's given you a better insight into advanced dihybrid crosses. We can see that we dealt with multiple alleles, epistatic relationships, codominance, sex-linked, all these types. If you feel you've gained a mastery for these problems, that's great, because usually that's as complex as these problems tend to get in the course. The only thing I'd like to end with, we did it the entire time, is please, please, please make sure that you are sticking to the steps, because if you do it, you will not miss anything. It may seem a little bit slow, but I promise you, it will lead you to the correct answer. In particular, like I said, that gamete step is so, so important, because what it can do is it can actually cut down your Punnett square by half or even more than that. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something from it. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode.